my name is Bita Ameri. These are my partners, Christopher McGreevy, Alexander Van Gorowski, and Todd Schwarzman. Uh, we are a biomedical engineering team, and um, our project is geared towards helping the hearing impaired. Um, hearing loss is currently the most prevalent and fastest growing disability in the United States. It is also the number one uh, birth defect in children. Um, we decided to do an experiment that will uh, improve the quality of life. Uh, the first part of our project was to do a, uh, uh, the first ever, actually the second ever, human clinical trial at Stevens. And the second part was to do a statistical analysis on the data we gathered from that human clinical trial. We used uh, an EEG to um, analyze the, uh, we used these sensors, Cleve Med program, and that very laptop <laughs> to analyze the signals um, produced in the human brain when um, a person is listening to music, a person is listening to speech, or listening to both at the same time. Hi, my name is Kylie Rohde. I'm a senior at Stevens. My major is civil engineering with concentration on structural. For my senior design project, I did the restoration of the Guggenheim Museum located on 5th Avenue between 88th and 89th Street. It's just a model showing the museum. So currently there is a restoration happening on the building where they stripped off the 12 layers of paint of the museum, which is a Frank Lloyd Wright building, um, because of the problem of cracking. They did laser scans of the building, as shown, and all the red are the cracking which is existing right now. So my project explored the causes of the cracking, which I deem to be the temperature differential as a minor cause, but basically the problem of wind loading was the major problem. So I studied and I made drawings from the original drawings of Frank Lloyd Wright. Um, these were 1959 drawings that I obtained through the Paratus Group, which is the museum's representatives. And from these drawings, I could do some wind calculations on the building. And um, from there, I saw that there wasn't sufficient reinforcement on the cantilevered walls. I'll show you a quick demonstration of what happened, these are the web walls and these are the cantilevered walls. And when the wind hits a building, it causes an ovaling effect. And with the ovaling, the cantilevered walls become um, deflected, which causes stresses in the concrete, which essentially um, cracks the building. And I'm here right now presenting our research on the investigation for the optimization of nanoparticle self-assemblies. The goal of this project was to create a nanoparticle assembly with a structure that resembled this shape right here. There are little spheres called nanoparticles that are about 100 nanometers in size. These particles are dispersed in a polymer matrix and um, in order to create this shape, we um, use a microreactor assembly in order to um, promote the dispersion of silica in the matrix. Here are pictures of our results using beaker mixing, um, which is a batch process. And you can see that this is um, silica nanoparticles, which have assembled together through dehydration of an emulsion. This picture right here is using two components, silica nanoparticles and a PVA polymer. You can see that the silica particles have assembled on the outside of the PVA core due to um, a desire to lower the chemical potential of the overall system. We were hoping that in using a microreactor, we could control the process of self-assembly through a different mechanism, primarily kinetics. In this picture right here, we have the results of the microreactor system. You can see that the assembly is much more wrinkled in shape. Um, this is due to the change in dehydration method. In beaker mixing, it was through heating. In the microreactor system, it's through the solubility of one phase in another. Um, so basically what we've done is we've maximized our aspect ratio, the ratio of the cord length to the wing length. Um, the constraint in that is that you have to maintain some structural integrity as well because the longer and wider that you make it, the more subject it is to forces at the joint as well as along the wing. Um, 
but at the same time you want to make it as large as possible because you want to get as much flow over the wing as possible to maximize your lift. Um, essentially what happens is if you don't do that, you lose a lot of flow to the sides. That's also why we have these things called horner plates on the sides. They direct flow um, over, over the wings themselves. We have uh, a few different control surfaces. These are the flaps, uh, James will show you that they work. They will be uh, put down. Uh, the flaps control uh, the rotational mo motion of the plane, uh, banking left the to the right. Uh, these are the, I'm sorry, the ailerons. Uh, another control surface is the, is the flap. The flap is created to uh, increase the amount of lift created by the wing. By turning it, we create a, a, a larger camber in the, in the wing. And uh, this increases the, the coefficient of lift, which then increases the, the amount of weight we can carry. My name is Phil Kimball. I'm a graduate of Stevens, class of 1962. I'm a naval architect and spent my life building ships, but I'm here today at the, the uh, Stevens Senior Design Project to see what the students have been working on. Uh, I'm currently the executive director of the Society of Naval Architects and Marine Engineers. And I work close by, so I thought it was a great opportunity to come over and meet some students and see what they're working on. Uh, Dan, you were telling me about the uh, substrate and, the and how you're going to how you're going to be drilling through that. Uh, um, well, the tunnel is about three miles long, and it will go through a variety of materials: some very hard rock, some softer silt materials and uh, it requires more than one machine to do the work for the various phases of the project, one of which will be through the river, underneath the Hudson River, which is primarily through a silt material. This, this is a profile um, from the draft environmental impact. How far statement. below the surface are you going to be? Um, it varies. Obviously, the deepest part is in through the Palisades, Jersey City Heights, um, a couple hundred feet at least below the street. Um, and that's going, I think, primarily through diabase rock. We also uh, gave a presentation for faculty at the end of last semester, and we did a presentation for the Tunnel Partnership, which consists of heads of New Jersey Transit, uh, heads of the Port Authority of, Port Authority of New York and New Jersey. The, some of the companies that are involved in the preliminary design. Good morning everyone, this is Team Remy, my name is Jamie Tutt, this is Lily Abalana and Patrick Brosey. We're um, biomedical engineering majors for the class of 2007 um, and we've made an integrated PCA and IV pump which you see here. Um, basically this is an alternative to an epidural. Um, we no longer have to relieve labor pains by placing a needle, needle and medication into the spine. We're doing this because epidurals can cause several complications, which can be as minor as a severe headache or as severe as, a, um, as paralysis, being that it is being placed near the spine and it's done solely by touch. There is no true way to figure out whether or not you're in the right place. You know, part of the training is that it, it makes a motion, the fence reacts to that motion. <laughs> This is our fencing training device and um, the basic idea here is that there's, there's training devices on the market for fencing today but the problem is that they're stationary and they have no arm movement. So it's not a very realistic way for a fencer to practice the basic techniques that he needs to build upon um, in order to 
react adequately to an opponent's attacks or uh, motions. And uh, just as a, a football player practices getting into a three-point stance and getting out of it as, as quickly and with as much power as he can, a fencer needs to build uh, basic techniques so that he reacts to motions on instinct and not having to think about whether his hand's in the right place or whether he's in proper distance to his opponent. Well, I was working in a chemical engineering group with Sarah Alphone, Jenny Hotomo, and Carolyn Butler. And together we worked on optimizing a carbon dioxide scrubbing unit used in anesthetic operations for a hospital setting. And over here is our system that we created. It consists of two hollow fiber membranes. The first hollow fiber membrane is used to absorb the carbon dioxide from a patient that breathes out into this inlet here. And the gas goes through the module and the CO2 is filtered out into solution and the clean gas comes out of here and goes back into the patient as a recycle. Now this module here contains a liquid membrane uh, solution that's made of carbonic anhydrase, an enzyme that effectively um, catalyzes the reaction of carb carbon dioxide to H2CO3. And that uh, the carbonate goes around in solution to a second module here where it's picked up by a sweep gas that flows countercurrently to the solution. And the sweep gas strips the carbon dioxide from the solution and it comes out of the waste stream here, which is basically air, and that releases the atmosphere. And this is a closed circuit solution for uh, the liquid side of the membrane. And the idea is to reduce the volume of the inlet to outlet gas streams such that we could use a more expensive anesthetic agent such as xenon. My name is Matthew Savari and this is Team Spinal Track with the Spinal Triaxial Rotary Electrogoniometer. What this basically does is it measures spinal range of motion in three planes, X, Z, and theta, so that uh, physical therapists can determine the efficacy of their therapy treatments from week to week comparing different ranges of motion of the spine. This is Brian Testa, this is Faisal Sadome, and I'm Matthew Savari on Team Spinatrack.